Hi, this is Presh Talwalker of Mind Your Decisions, and today I want to prove that pi is irrational. This video will be based on a simple proof by the number theorist Ivan Niven. I have given a link to the paper in the description for the video. Before we get started, I will warn, even though they call it a simple proof, this does involve high school calculus and the following concepts. With that caution in mind, let's get started. The proof that pi is rational will involve four steps. The first step is to assume it is rational, that it can be represented as a fraction a over b for integers a and b. The next step is we will define a function f of x that depends on those constants a and b. The third step, which will be the most important, is to prove that the integral of f of x times sine x evaluated from 0 to pi will end up both being an integer and it will be a fraction between 0 and 1. This will be the contradiction and that will allow us to prove that pi is irrational. The first step of the proof is easy. By the definition of a rational number, if we assume pi is rational, that means pi will equal a over b for integers a and b. From this, we will define a function that depends on a and b. The next step is to define the function f of x as x to the n times a minus bx, the quantity to the power n, all divided by n factorial. This seems like a complicated function, and it may remind you of functions, the Taylor series expansion of functions you've seen already, like e to the x, sine of x, or cosine x, and this will become important. The reason f of x is defined in this way will become clear as we learn some of its properties. So let's get to understanding f of x. A couple of properties we can see right away. The first is that f of 0 will equal 0. This you can see directly by substituting 0 for x, and you'll see that term x to the n uh, will just multiply out everything to 0. Another property is that f of pi minus x will equal f of x. This property is a little bit harder to prove but it can be proved by direct substitution and the fact that pi equals a over b. I will leave the details of that proof to you, or you can read, uh, I have provided a link to my blog post where you'll see all the algebra. In this video, I just want to say these are properties and we'll continue going. There will be a lot of details I will skip over because there are some more properties we have to get to. The third useful property of f of x is that all of its derivative, its first derivative, its second derivative, and so on, evaluated at zero, uh, will be an integer. This is something that will require verification but the general idea is that f of x, you can see it's a polynomial of degree 2n, and it has integer coefficients. So when you take the derivative and you evaluate it at 0, you're going to end up with an integer value. So keeping this property in mind, that all of its derivatives evaluated at 0 are integers, we can then derive the next property which is that all the derivatives evaluated at pi, uh, each of those will also be an integer. This result follows from the fact that f of pi minus x equals f of x, which we showed earlier, and then we use the chain rule to figure out what the derivative of f evaluated at pi is. It will be the opposite of the value of 
it's uh, the derivative evaluated at zero or the same value and since those were integers this will also be an integer. So now we have four useful properties of f, f of x. We will now get to something even more complicated. We're going to define another function which is going to be uh, the sum of several derivatives of f of x. We're going to define g of x to equal f of x minus the second derivative plus the fourth derivative and so on until we go all the way to the derivative 2n. The reason we go to 2n is that f of x is a polynomial of degree 2n, uh, so beyond that all the derivatives will be zero. So what's the point of defining this function g of x, which will be the, you know, the sum of all of these derivatives? Well, now we end up with some more useful properties of g of x. Uh, the first property is that g of 0 and g of pi are going to be integers. Why is that? Well, we just showed that f evaluated at 0 and all of its derivatives were integers, and f evaluated at pi and all of its derivatives evaluated at pi or zero, uh, are integers. So the fact that f and all its derivatives at 0 uh, and f and all its derivatives evaluated at pi are integers, you put those two facts together to conclude that g of 0 and g of pi, which are the sum of those, uh, are also integers. There's another property of g of x which will become important. It's the fact that the second derivative of g plus g of x uh, will equal the function f of x. This is pretty easy to verify uh, you can just directly compute the second derivative of g of x uh, and you'll see that all of the terms cancel except for f of x. With these properties in mind, we're going to go to something just very cool about g of x. We're going to take the derivative of g prime of x sine x minus g of x cosine of x. Now I'm skipping a lot of algebra here, but you can prove that the derivative of that function will equal f of x sine x. The reason behind this is the uh, if you take the chain rule of derivatives and you keep the property that the second derivative of g of x uh, plus g of x equals f of x, after all that algebra you'll find out that this function I've written out for you will in fact its derivative be f of x sine x. So why have we done all this work? We've done all this work because now we know a function whose derivative is f of x sine x. In other words we figured out what the antiderivative of f of x sine x is. So now we can get on to the step of integrating f of x sine x. When we integrate f of x sine x, we have that antiderivative, which we just showed, and we're going to want to evaluate that antiderivative at, at pi and subtract that from its value at zero. When you do that, I'm skipping a lot of algebra right here, you end up with the integral of f of x sine x will be equal to g of zero plus g of pi. a nice little result, a compact way of expressing the integral of f of x sine x. So what's important about this result? Well we just showed that g of 0 and g of pi are integers, therefore we have proven that this integral of f of x sine x from 0 to pi will also be an integer. So that's one step. We're going to show that this integral has to be an integer. Now that we've come to that step, we're going to show the integral, come up with the integral in a very different way. So we'll get back to the properties of f of x, sine x. We're going to estimate this integral, and we want to estimate it on 
the region 0 to pi. So we end up with this inequality that f of x sine x will be between 0 and the quantity a to the n pi to the n over n factorial. The reason for this is that f of x sine x will always be positive. Sine x is always positive and f of x is a polynomial with positive coefficients. The, that's the, for the reason why we have uh, the f of x sine x being greater than zero. On the other hand, we have an upper bound for f of x sine x, and that comes from the fact, uh, the definition of f of x, uh, which is x to the n, a minus, bx to the n. If you take that value at pi, it will definitely be greater, uh, sorry, it will be less than a to the n pi to the n over n factorial. So we've created a bound on f of x sine x. Now what we can do is we can integrate all three values. So if we integrate 0 from 0 to pi, we just end up with 0. If we integrate f of x sine x, we end up with the integral from 0 to pi. And if we integrate a to the n, pi to the n, n factorial, uh, that's just a constant term, we end up with another pi. So we have a to the n, pi to the n plus 1 over n factorial. So we can now say that we know that f of x sine x, the integral, has to be between 0. It has to be positive. But it also has to be less than a to the n, pi to the n plus 1 over n factorial. What does that mean? Well, so far we've said nothing about a, the, the, the value of n. n could have equaled 1, n could have equaled 2, 3, uh, a million, 10 million. But as, as n gets larger, there is something that happens to a to the n, pi to the n plus 1 over n factorial we can show that this term will tend towards zero as n goes to infinity. There are many ways to prove this. One is, if you remember the Taylor expansion of e to the x, uh, we have e to the a pi will be the sum of a to the pi to the n over n factorial. We know that that's a convergent series, so each of its terms, a pi to the n over n factorial, must tend to zero. In any convergent series, each individual term has to go towards zero. Otherwise, the series would never converge. It would just keep getting bigger and bigger. The point of all this is we've proven the integral of f of x sine x will keep getting smaller as n gets bigger. In fact, for some sufficiently large n, we're going to have that this f of x sine x, this integral, will be less than 1. It will be a fraction. And that's the problem. Why? We'll put it all together. We've started out with the assumption that if pi is rational, then we can create a function such that number 1, its integral from 0 to pi uh, will be g of 0 plus g of pi. This will be an integer. And on the other hand, we found, using the same valid reasoning, that we can have that same integral be bounded, and as n gets larger, it'll be a fraction between 0 and 1. Now, it's impossible that this integral is both an integer and a fraction between 0 and 1. This is the contradiction. So now we can come to the conclusion. Assuming pi is rational, therefore, leads to a contradiction. Therefore, it must be the case that pi is irrational. QED. I hope you have enjoyed this proof. I know it involved a lot of math. I want to thank you for watching. I hope you keep up with Mind Your Decisions. Either please subscribe to the videos, or you can also check out the website, or follow me on Twitter.